You're listening to The Vent Podcast, where we bring you interviews and stories from around the world of wine and spirits. From winemakers and critics to sommeliers and master distillers, we'll explore the people and businesses who are instrumental in shaping the future of today's food and drinks culture. Enjoy the show. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of The Vent Podcast, presented by our good friends at Coravin. Coravin is the world leader in at-home wine preservation, allowing you to pour a glass of your favorite wine without having to pop the cork. And as always, I'm joined by Billy Galanko, who is dressed to the nines today with a collared shirt on, the vent hat. How are you doing, Billy? Doing well, doing well. We had a busy, busy week last week. I was recording on the road, so it's good to be, be back in studio. And I had a, a great weekend actually with, with my Corbin. The, the team was lucky enough to send me a, a new one. So I got to compare my old timeless with the new timeless. And while they're pretty much the same, they definitely have refined it and made it actually a little bit smaller and, and easier to use. So that was, that was pretty exciting this weekend. And then also, I have yet to try it out, but they have an aerator feature now on it because that's one of the things, like when you only pull out a little bit of wine at a time, you're not necessarily decanting it or anything. I actually forgot what it was and I was just like looking at it for five minutes. What, what do I do with this? And I was like, ah, yes, it's the aerator. Nice. So I, I haven't opened the one with the aerator yet to use but does it have a filter on it is it like a is there a screen to does it does it catch any sediment i i think i don't i don't know about the sediment again i haven't used it but from what it looks like is it just sprays it out in more of like a a pattern so you're exposing more of it to oxygen surface area at the time Mm -hmm. so we're gonna have to have to try it out but i was also trying i was using it on white wines this weekend so it wasn't as necessary to aerate on the way out yeah i also realized that they make a bunch of different needle sizes and styles. If you have an older cork, for instance, they have a needle that's designed specifically for old and fragile corks, which I didn't know anything about that. So that was, yeah, learning a little bit more too. So if you have old wine and you don't want to use your Durand or your Asso with your corks, you can use a Corvin as well. I actually didn't know that either. I will, I will look into that. But speaking of corks, we have a quote unquote, no pun intended, or not pun intended, but cork dork on <laughs> this week for, for our interview, Bianca Bosker, uh, exciting someone I had been wanting to speak to for literally since basically my whole wine journey. So this was an exciting day. Yeah. Bianca's awesome. She's one of those salt of the earth wine people who is absent all of the pretense and stuff that people hate about sort of wine folks. And so she was undercover, so to speak, in the wine industry for some time and actually became a wine person herself. And her book is a deep dive from a wine enthusiast perspective on what it's like to enter and uh, be exposed to all kinds of different aspects of the wine, the wine industry. So it was, yeah. Yeah, it was great getting with her. What I, what I really liked about, so the reason I wanted to talk to her for so long is she and I had very similar. She also came out with a new book that's called Get the Picture, which is about art. So they're the two things that I used to study art history, which is actually what eventually got me into wine. And obviously, I'm very much into wine now. So when I, she and I got into wine very much the same way. We were both based in New York and did the whirlwind version of education and then taking the certified sommelier exam. Mine was a little bit more condensed, but I went from knowing really nothing about wine to certified som and she did basically the same way, but what she did is more of a conscious effort. And she took, she went around through the various aspects of wine culture. So she trained with sommeliers. She went and worked the floor for a while with people actually working as sommeliers. She met with people at wine shops. She even went and talked to like neurologists and people talking about like your sense of smell and taste and, and all of these things. So she really did like a deep dive. But at the end of the day, she took her introductory sommelier exam in New York exactly where I took my exam. And I think living in New York is like the perfect place for if you want to get to learn wine fast to be because you basically have access to wine from all over the world at your fingertips, even in the half bottle. So it's a perfect place to to learn really quickly. So she took her intro the exact same place. And then she took her certified exam in Virginia Beach, Virginia, which is where I'm from, which I actually ended up taking my certified there too, for the reason being that the one in New York always fills up really fast. So it was really cool to to talk to her because the reason I read her book initially was my mom read it to understand what does it mean that Billy is going to the certified sommelier exam because I don't even know what a sommelier is. So that was pretty cool. 
my son's a court dork. Why? <laughs> this should have been the name of the of the, of the book. Yeah. Yeah. New York too is there. There's so many like tasting groups and opportunities to do it and go to industry tastings and things like that in New York that you just don't get a lot of places around the country, maybe say LA or Chicago. But yeah, the, the wine scene is crazy up there and she definitely immersed herself in all of it. Yeah. She was lucky because she, not lucky, she, she put herself in the middle of it and then she got invited to all those tastings. I think the only, yeah. since I was working in advertising, the only tastings I got invited to were a friend of mine was in Columbia Law School and they had a, a wine club and they invited me up there. But luckily, pretty nice you're in your Columbia Law because all these producers do want, they know they're going to make a lot of money. So basically a lot of producers would host tastings for them or distributors. Yeah. So we got to try some, some neat stuff. But so we talk about that book a lot. I think it's really exciting. It gives people an interesting kind of boots on the ground point of view of what it's like to be a sommelier and how you, how you learn this and how people go about some training and like how much people really devote their lives to wine and how it can actually like impact and shape your personal relationships and, and things like that. And then we'd also talk a bit about her, her other book, Get the Picture, which just came out. And she does the same exact model of trying to understand the art scene in New York. She works at galleries. She helps produce, or I guess they're not called producers, helps artists. She works shows. She actually sells art. And it's like kind of that same immersive 3D, also working on sensual senses. She works in a museum. So it's cool to, she does both, both of these things in the same way. And we're able to talk about how art overlaps with wine and how, the, how these senses and how kind of learning in both of these spaces that can seem really intimidating or exclusive, but everybody's exposed to them all the time and how that overlaps. And I thought it was a really cool, cool juxtaposition and conversation overall. Yeah. For someone who I think considers herself like a journalist and a writer, first and foremost, to come into both of these spaces and to have actually, especially on the, the art side, to get fairly quickly ingrained in the culture and connected with folks who are really moving the needle in the wine world is super impressive. And so she's definitely props to her for her ability as an undercover journalist and getting to the root of some of these industries. And yeah, I think she came out on the other side, having a newfound appreciation and for both wine and art, and also understanding some of the shortcomings as well, which is, yeah, provides a pretty well-rounded perspective, I think. Yeah, that, I think that was my other favorite part is she really gives you her honest opinion on yep. all the folks and the aspects of these. So I, I think it's a nice it's obviously from her point of view, but a nice perspective of, of these spaces without uh, sticker coding it or any lenses that they people want you to see from the inside. Yeah, so it's a great it's a great episode. If you love wine, if you love art, if you're interested in the inner workings and uh, yeah, Bianca Bosker is certainly has earned her chops as an expert in both being immersed in them. And so it was awesome to have her on. And before we dive into her interview, everybody just go. Her books are called Cork Dork and get the picture. You can find them on anywhere you buy books. They're also on Audible. She reads them herself. So that's also really interesting. That's how I first listened to them. So check out her books. And now here's our interview with Bianca Bosker. Before we get to our interview, here's a quick note from Corbin. Remember, if you're looking to drink more wine from your cellar without worrying about wasting what you can't consume, one of the Corvin systems will be your best friend. You can visit www.corvin.com and use code VINT15 for 15% off your purchase of one of their awesome devices. If you're a member of the trade, visit www.trade.corvin.com. You can get exclusive discounts on the range of their products and accessories for your home and work. Here's our interview. All right, we are here with very special guest, Bianca Bosker. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy to be here with you guys. Yeah, I, I don't know if I've fully explained our parallel paths, but after you let the readers know a little bit about your two books and, um, and how your wine, bo wine book, your wine journey in Cork Dork went, I'll share my parallel paths and I think they're going to be eerie. But I do have to thank my mom for actually turning you on, me on to both of your books because she, when I went home to take my certified exam, she was like, oh, I just read this book by a lady who did what you did. And I was like, are you sure? And then turns out she basically did exactly what I did. And then just a few months ago, she was like, did you know that lady who wrote that book that did the thing that you did also wrote about art? She's just like you because one of my undergrad majors was art history. So she's like, wow. art. Wow. <laughs> Thank you, Billy's so, mom. Yeah. <laughs> so she's on top of things. But Billy's mom, I, fan of the pod too. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't know how podcasts work, but that's fine. 
But anyways, I'd love to get a little bit of a, have the audience get a little bit of your background and then explain, well, we'll ease into what I just rambled about in reference as we go through the conversation. Yeah. So I don't know how far back you want to go. I was born a young babe in Portland, Oregon, grew up there, came east for college, did a lot of journalism throughout my time in college, both over the summers and also while I was a student in college. And then I was also an East Asian studies major, so I learned Chinese, spent a lot of time in China. And then I graduated, did not go straight into journalism, but ended up there very quickly. My first job was was not a, a, a dream fit. And I ended up working at the Huffington Post, where I was the executive tech editor and the co-founder of the site's tech section. I was there for a number of years, and then I left to train as a sommelier. And that journey led to Cork Dork which came out a few years ago. And during and after that, I continued freelancing, writing for a number of different publications. I've written for The New Yorker, The New York Times. I'm a contributing writer at The Atlantic. And I most recently wrote a new book, also nonfiction, called Get the Picture, which is all about the wild, weird, wonderful world of art. Is that the haiku version? Does that work? Yeah, Yeah, that was was very, very efficient. Yeah. So I I think that that is so interesting that you were able to, can you actually, I I was, I was, I'm thinking because I have so much background knowledge of just, just reading, get the picture and having cork dork. Can you explain a little bit about your process for each of these? And then we'll talk a little bit more about each book in particular about like the nuances, but you follow the same kind of pattern into getting to know both of these um, reps. Yeah. In both cases, I embrace, I embrace what I guess is called like immersive journalism. Um, I believe in learning by doing, and even more so after Cork Dork. So in the case of Cork Dork, um, like I said, I quit my job at HuffPost and decided to train as a sommelier. And there were a number of reasons why I decided to do it in that case. One was basically that book for me started out of going out to dinner one night and I was with my husband and a friend of his who loves wine. And I couldn't have cared less about wine at that point in my life. I picked wines basically on their labels. I always got annoyed when I had to drink and buy wine because I was like, why am I spending money on this thing? I don't understand like, what I'm even looking for, what I'm trying to taste, why I'm drinking this thing as opposed to something else. And we were out to dinner and the sommelier, I barely knew that word at the time, I think. And so he mentioned that he was preparing for something called like the best sommelier in the world competition. And that sounded totally absurd to me. I was like, how could pouring wine possibly be high stakes? You open a bottle, you pour it, you're done. No one breaks a sweat in that process. But I like competitive eating things. So I thought competitive drinking could be interesting. And so I started looking into it. And long story short, I got hooked on binge watching these videos of this best sommelier in the world competition, which is essentially the Westminster dog show with booze. And what really drew me in was the passion that these psalms brought to wine. I'd always thought of wine as this thing of pleasure. You drink it at the end of a long day. It helps relax. And they had turned it into something approaching sheer god-awful pain, divorcing their spouses to spend more time studying grape regions, hiring voice coaches and memory coaches to ace these competitions and these exams. And I think for me, I'm I'm someone who's obsessed with obsession. And so that passion really drew me in. I was very curious why, like, why do people make such a big deal out of this thing that at the end of the day, I'm sorry to be so crude, but like it turns into expensive pee. Like you drink it and it's done. And at the same time, and I think this is part of what inspired me to, to take this immersive approach. I had spent years as a tech editor, staring at screens, writing about things that happen on screens. And there was something about the way that Psalms lived and celebrated these forgotten senses of taste and smell that was so intriguing to me. They had sniffing skills that I associate with like bomb sniffing dogs at airport. And I felt like maybe I was missing out on something. I wanted to figure out what it was. And so I decided I didn't want to just write about these cork dorks. I wanted to see if I could become one of them. And so that's what prompted me to totally upend my life to start drinking very heavily at 9 a.m. on weekday mornings. Um, And that's the secret to my success. But it was, and I think for the next book, Forget the Picture, that experience of learning by doing was so 
revealing and so exciting that I just, I really became sold on that process. I guess there's drawbacks in every, to every way of asking questions, of doing research, even if you're in a scientific lab with control groups and all that. But nonetheless, like I will tell you, there is something very different about in an interview, let's say asking a gallerist or a SOM how they sell a bottle of wine or a painting versus, as I've now done, selling a $10,000 painting or sorry, a photograph from the back seat of an Uber during the crazy art fairs of Art Basel at Miami Beach while people are doing cocaine around you. You know what I mean? You begin to understand things differently when you've spent eight hours or whatever it is on the restaurant floor. Um, and so forget the picture. It was another project where likewise, the, this magnetic passion of the people in the world drew me in and also felt so outsized compared to my own failure to appreciate art that I wanted to throw myself in. And so I did. I think that, that part of the reason you just touched on it, why movies like Psalm were so popular is because you just said it there at the end, it's a world where most people have sub-zero knowledge of really the inner workings of what goes on and what it takes to excel in a career. And as a Psalm, we're in hospitality generally. Most people have never even been to a restaurant where a Psalm works and then serves in the manner that is pictured in movies like that. And I think that's a, yeah, that's a really good observation of there's something alluring about, hey, I know nothing about this, but these people have dedicated every ounce of their entire day and they're and stripped away parts of their life to to explore it. That must be worth at least looking into. Yeah, I think these are amazing specialized communities that at the same time shed light on much bigger issues and questions in our lives. And as a writer and, and, and as a human being, I'm always very interested in these, these groups of people who are A, very passionate, but B, doing something that on the surface may appear somewhat, I don't know, niche or, or specialized, but when you really dig into it, has formidable, important lessons for all of us on how we can live our lives. So as you went through the, your SOM journey, did you end up working the floor anywhere or did you take the exam and, or how did that progress and like how experiential did you get? Yeah, absolutely. So I had this goal almost from the outset that I wanted to take the Court of Master Sommelier's Certified Sommelier exam. And part of that was I wanted really some benchmark. I there's a lot of BS in the world of wine. There's a lot of hand-waving. And I really wanted something concrete by which to measure my progress, if any. And I also felt like certified exam, being a certified sommelier was, as it was explained to me, was a gold standard for working the floor. And I did eventually want to actually work the floor as a SOM. And yeah, without giving too much away, I threw myself into the process of preparing for that exam. And one of the things that I did, for those who don't know, there's at that point, there were three parts to it. So there's a theory section, which is basically like testing your knowledge of wine minutia, the altitude at which certain grapes are grown or geographic specification, you name it. There is a service section, which tests um, you know, your ability to actually pour wine in the correct manner to master all two dozen steps involved in correctly pouring a glass of red wine, none of which I knew existed at the outset. And or I should say, who knew at the outset that for me, there could possibly be that many steps involved. Um, and then there is a tasting section, a blind tasting section, where you are presented with a glass of wine and you have to, based on just that liquid in front of you, figure out what kind of grape, where it was grown, when it was made, and so on. And as part of my preparation for the exam, I began, I should say the wine industry, I think, it's still very traditional in the sense that there's more of a, it's more of a mentorship system, right? It is still about kind of apprenticeship, about learning from people. There wasn't a class that I could take to pass the exam. There wasn't like a specific school that I could go to. And so I started looking around for a real wine mentor. And um, I ended up getting involved with a couple of different tasting groups made up of aspiring master sommeliers, people who were committing their lives to passing one of the most difficult exams in the world. And I was lucky that there was one person in particular, Morgan Harris, who, who took me under his wing. But, you know, it was, I felt like a real boot camp in beginning to tune into savoring these often neglected senses of taste and smell and understanding 
what changes when we begin to appreciate them. And in my experience, practically everything, so much changes. One thing, and I, I won't give a lot away either. One thing I like about your books, though, is that you also look at a scientific side of things and kind of how, how these sensory things, both visually and, and memory-wise and feelings for art and also smell and everything, for wine, kind of are physically happening, what, what's happening scientifically. Can you explain it, or at least like really high level, some of the quick learnings you had on like how to smell better? I was just re-listening to some of that chapter, and I thought that was some of those things that like people are like, how could you go from this to that? Don't you have to already have the, the ability? But Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I realized I got totally carried away and didn't actually answer Brady's question. But yes, I did eventually end up working the floor at a place in Terroir in New York, which is still my favorite place in the city to drink wine. So if you're if you're here, you visit, go see Paul at Terroir. And yet, oh yeah, so I really believe in taking an interdisciplinary approach. And so I, like I said, was studying at the knees of these talented sommeliers, but at the same time, I wanted to fact check it. I wanted to understand what does science tell us about how we improve our sense of taste and smell? Are these traditions that have passed, been passed down from psalm to psalm over the generations, do they check out? Are they legit? Is this sort of superstition? What's going on here? And I do think that one of the things that allowed me to make progress as quickly as I did was the fact that I was working, working at it from these very different angles. I think top line, the thing I'll say from the science, which is fascinating, is that any of us can improve our senses of, our sense of smell. And I think that there is this myth that I encountered over and over again, especially at the outset, that if you weren't born a great sniffer, you'd never be one. That the key to appreciating wine or to advancing in the ranks of the som sommelier was to have won the genetic lottery. I remember meeting a psalm who really made me panic because he described how when he was growing up, his sense of smell was so good that his mom would like hide cookies in the kitchen and he had to find them based on smell alone. This was a terrifying anecdote for me because when I was that same age, I would go to school with dog bones in my pocket and my mom would be like, oh, do you want a granola bar for a you know, snack or recess? And I was like, no, no, I've got it covered because I knew that I had dog bones. And to me, there was like no flavor difference. I could distinguish between a granola bar and a dog bone. So I didn't feel like I had won any, any particular nothing lottery. What the science shows, though, again, is that not, first of all, we're much better smellers than we give ourselves credit for. We're better than dogs when it comes to certain odors, um, rats, which are like super sniffers as well when it comes to certain smells. Um, but also we can get better. And I think one of the key things to, to getting better is basically just doing the old factory version of flashcards. Um, I think another piece I would add just as a precursor to that is that you really need to build your sense memory. You're never going to be able to smell strawberry and wine if you can't smell strawberry and strawberry. And so one of the advices I got not from a scientist, but from sommeliers was really, if you want to get more out of your wine, you have to begin by building this library of odors. And that's the first kind of advice I would give is just go around and sniff everything in the course of your day-to-day -day life and describe it. That is key. Putting language on smell is very important for us to lock it in our mind. Sniff your toothpaste, sniff your shampoo, Sniff the coffee in the morning and try and describe it to yourself. But then the second thing is the science shows that like with repeated exposure, with sort of a olfactory workout by making yourself smell that coffee every morning or smell a lineup of odors, you can get better and enhance your ability to pick out those aromas. And I think even, I haven't looked at the studies in a while, but I think even enhance perhaps your sensitivity to them. And the other really fascinating piece of this is that all of us have what are called specific anosmias. Anosmia is the olfactory version of a blindness. It means you can't smell those specific odors. And so if you've ever been in a room where people are like, oh, oh, do you smell the lilies? And you're like, I have no idea what anyone's talking about. Maybe you have a specific anosmia for the scent of lilies. There is research that shows that we can train ourselves to pick up that smell to which we have a specific anosmia. Again, it's, it's that kind of workout. It's like doing these reps with these odors and smelling them naming them and just doing it over and over and over again. Smell, let's not forget, is a, is a physical process. We're talking about olfactory molecules lodging up in our olfactory cavity, whatever it's called. Yeah, I think, I think there's a lot of good news around what we're able to do as far as sniffing. And I think that the more that we 
push ourselves to improve, the more we'll get out of wine, but the more we get out of everything. There's so much information and beauty in the world around us that I think we neglect because we haven't taken the time to tune into these senses. Agreed. Agreed. I, I love that. The idea, like a lot of my friends, whenever they're, they're like, I can't taste this or I can't smell this. Uh, I never will. And they just don't try. I'm like, well, you could. <laughs> Great. What I, I want to, I'm going to briefly share my, my sommelier story real quick. So then we can get also to get the picture and then comparing the two books. But so I was living in New York at the time. And then I had watched some a million times. It was like December, 2016. I wondered just like you, how do people actually get into taking this exam? I signed up, I took the intro exam in March, but I had never prior to that, that December, I basically just like you had wine occasionally. I knew one label. It was a multiple Chiano de Brutto. Everybody loves those. Um, and I took the intro just like you. I realized I didn't get a pin. I didn't really get to put it on my resume. I couldn't do anything with it. So I took the certified a month and a half later, early May, like six weeks later. And I, I luckily had a buddy who owned a wine shop on the Upper East Side. So he let me, he was a certified SOM. So he walked me through what the process was and helped me like, let me lead classes there, which is weird because I had only known wine for four months, but it worked out well. And I passed the certified exam. So and then I had, but the interesting part was I had taken the intro in New York, couldn't get into the certified because it was full in New York. So I went back to actually where I'm from, Virginia Beach, and took the certified exam at Zoe's, just like you. But I, I will say I have one question about, not question, now living in big cities, New York and LA now for an extended period of time, your description of Virginia Beach was quite interesting. And I want to get your opinion on what you thought while you were actually there. But I did look up that when I looked up the history, because I recently re-listened to the section and you mentioned that, that the beach was like not real. And like my family's not originally from Virginia Beach, so I don't really have that much Virginia Beach pride. But I think there was a beach there before. But then I realized when I was growing up, the water was hitting the seawall. So I was like, wait a minute, maybe she's right. Maybe there was no beach. Turns out we basically just had dunes, not an extended beach. And what you see there now is all pumped in. But I just had to <laughs> get that off my chest. Okay, great. Wow. No, I appreciate that. Yeah, if there's a correction to be made, let me know. We should no, no. It. no you, turns out you were right. I was like, oh, man. <laughs> uh, no, but it was an incredible experience to go down. I have very fond memories, and I think it was really, really valuable. I think to to get out of New York and see the wine, the fine wine industry in action elsewhere, for sure. Yeah, I, I guess the thing that resonated with me when I went down there and I had the, I think we had the same sentiment. This is really like what I wanted to get to is when I was taking the exam, so many people like the lady that you drove around with were like, I really need this for a raise. I'm like, this is my second or third time taking it. And just like you, I was like, I'm here for fun, I hope. And then when I did it, only two out of the 14 people taking it passed and I was one of them. So I felt so bad because I was like, I really don't need this. And everybody else who was going to have to sign up and take it again. But outside of New York, I don't think I didn't really get that urgency as much. Yeah. And then I have to say Terroir is also my favorite restaurant or my favorite wine place in New York. That's a, we're going to have to work on getting Paul on the podcast too. Yeah, so. absolutely. Yeah. I think thinking back to the exam, I think another thing that continues to irk me about it is I remember so many of the people taking the exam were, had never tried the wines that they were being forced to recommend or talk about. Right. And we're talking about these champagnes or these incredible Bordeaux. These are wines that are incredibly expensive. They're hard to find. And it did feel to me like in the structure of the exam at the time, we were forcing people to just memorize and repeat inherited wisdoms rather than teaching them to taste for themselves. And I do think that that is a bone that I have to pick with the wine world. I do think, anyway, I could talk, there's a little, some controversy when, the, when, when Quartra came out, but, but basically my sort of takeaway from it was that there is too often, I think the wine world tells people what to taste instead of teaching them how to taste. And I think that that's a huge oversight. I think that we shouldn't have to be beholden to critics. We should be able to learn for ourselves and in the process, embrace our own preferences and tastes. And so it just, there was something, there was something about that idea that, yeah, here were people, it just felt very disconnected. I think that there were parts of the exam that like felt very disconnected from the real skills that people needed and also the experiences that they'd had with wine. And, and I hope it's gotten an update since then. I haven't really taken it since then, so I don't know, but 
That may be. Keep your fingers crossed. Yeah. I'll, I'll let Brady hop in here in a second. But I, I will say, I think the only, and I guess not defense of the exam, but I guess if you're a server at a, some of these really fine restaurants, there's some way like the whoever's leading the wine program is going to try to have you taste as much as possible so you can properly describe the wine. But I guess in theory, you're always going to be trying, you're serving some wines that you may or may not have had before. So if you taste it right at the table, but yeah, I don't know. That's, that's a really, that's how I felt. I came after out of it having imposter syndrome. I was a certified SOM and I was just like, most of what I was describing. Yeah. I, I haven't even seen much less tasted. So yeah. Cool. Brady, do you want to, you want to hop in and we'll pivot over to get the picture as well? Yeah. I'm always interested in controversy. Yeah. I think the, the idea that, that the wine world is reserved for a select few and that the wines really that if you're sommelier that you want to aspire to be pouring are wines that the average sommelier would never be able to afford is yeah, intriguing juxtaposed against all the psalms I know who work in high-end restaurants are drinking these wines way more often than I am too, uh, which is so it's kind of, there's, there's an interesting relationship there where you have a client who's spending $1,000 plus on a bottle and you're able to have a sip in the back. It's just an interesting kind of social dynamic because I feel like that's often, it's not for like your 100 or $200 bottle, but for your $1,000 plus grail bottle. That is often how folks experience um, those wines. And I know the hyper expensive wines that I've had have only been in the context where like a company was paying to have the wines at a certain event or our company was doing something um, like that. And I think that's probably the experience of 99.5% of people in the industry where, you know, when they get to try those wines. Did you splurge initially to, to try a bunch of things that you knew you were only going to have once, if not in another context? To, to explore there? Or did you really go from the ground up drinking Trader Joe's wine the way that the rest of us did? I, I, I'm i sure that there were exam, there were, I'm sure there were wines on my own certified SOM exam that I was kind of tested on and asked to discuss mm -hmm. that I'd never tried. Maybe I've tried them since. I, I do think that there are these opportunities, whether it's the back after you're, you've opened a wine to bring to a table or it's at these industry tasting events where you begin to have the opportunity to to get little tastes of these. And I was lucky enough to go to the crazy orgy that is La Polet or just seize on any opportunity I could for people in the industry to try wines. And yeah, whether it was like during the stage I did at Morea or it was like an auction, something hosted by an auction house where they were opening up some big old mega bottles of things. And you just try and map that, add that into your, your mental map and your, and your sense memory. But, but yes, I will say that, that a huge liability of, spoiler, like now developing my own obsession for wine after this was that I have developed like a crippling weakness, weakness for vintage champagne, which is not too buck chop. Let's put it that way. So any opportunity that I can find to, to get into those bottles, I'm there. So yeah, so, just before we move on to the, to, to your other book, wanna, what are you drinking now? What's, what does your relationship to wine look like now? Do you, what do you open on Tuesday night? Do you do that? Do you still go to wine bars? Yeah. Yeah. No. And I'm, I'm a big believer in not saving wines for special occasions, but in opening wines to make occasion special. I think that there's something really exciting about opening that bottle that you've been saving for a big anniversary on a Wednesday and like making that Wednesday your holiday, like the new holiday that you will now remember, hopefully like every year into it'll become like annual the day I opened that overly expensive vintage champagne day. I would say that the wine, while I was really trying to pass my psalm exams, I was deep into the noble grape varieties and just trying to master sort of the classic. And I think since then, I've been able to to just enjoy the process of discovery and adventure. And I think when I go to a restaurant, like I'm all, pretty much always inclined to get the wine that I've never tried before. And I think that's an influence of Paul Greco at Terroir. He used to make people promise to never drink the same wine twice. And as someone who had witnessed people stockpiling cases or settling on their this was their favorite wine that they always got. That advice seemed so absurd to me and irrational. And I've come to see that he's totally right. It's in the same way that there are more books than we could ever read in a lifetime, but there are certain books that we reread and they change a little bit each time or we change when we read them. There are more wines than you could ever try in a lifetime. 
And so I think there's something to be said for really exploring. And so for me, I think on a typical Tuesday, lately I've been very, continue to be really um, into the wines um, from Slovenia and also like Northern Italy, like sort of like Venezia, Giulia, um, Sicily as well, I think are such a great bang for the buck. Um, and also I think a real crowd pleaser. But like I said, always, always excited to like branch out. That's great. I love all the Friuli wines and Slovenia wines as well. So thinking about the parallels now, pivoting over a little bit to art, some people would say that we well, are saying that the, the best wines in the world are very hard to access, much less taste. And then they would argue that maybe the wine world is more open because you can go see these masterpieces in museums and stuff. Can you talk a little bit about how maybe that might not be necessarily the, the, the case and, and my misconception? Yeah. So by way of background for people that haven't read the book, just briefly, what brought me from wine to the art world, I guess it wasn't a straight shot, but but basically it had been a little bit different for me. I knew a bit about, about wine, but art had really been a passion of mine growing up. And then at some point, as I moved to New York and rounded the curve into adulthood, we stopped speaking. And I would go to galleries and museums and really, A, I consistently felt like I was two tattoos and a master's degree away from figuring out what the hell was going on inside these galleries. I did not understand the art or whether it, why it was art. But also, yeah, I think that just led to this feeling that, like I didn't know what was going on and I didn't belong. And so I, I took the coward's way out and I withdrew. And then a few years back, I really had this gnawing fear, this thing that just kept tugging at me that maybe by turning my back on art, I was missing out on something really major. And so I decided to try reconnecting and going back to galleries and museums and seeing what I could discover. And I'll be honest, like the art was still very off-putting to me, but the people fascinated me. Like I could not look away. And, and similarly to wine, it was their passion. I'd never met a group of people willing to sacrifice so much for something of so little, to me, obvious practical value. Artists who treat century old paintings like they're as necessary as vital organs and scientists i discover are right there with artists and telling us that art is a fundamental part of our humanity one biologist says it's as necessary to us as food or sex i didn't know the feeling but that passion drew me in and also a sense there was something about the way that they were living life that felt so much more expansive compared to like my own claustrophobic existence of texting from the toilet while listening to podcasts. No offense to podcasts, they're great, but just so what, what is that? What was I doing? And, and, and I think also artists really confirmed that I was, I was missing out. They said I lacked visual literacy, which they said was downright dangerous in a world so saturated with images. And I became really intrigued by this question of whether I could see art and whether I could see the world the way they did and what would change if I could. And so I decided that like with wine, I wanted to throw myself into the nerve center of the fine art world and see what I could find out. And to your point about accessibility, it turns out that no one except me thought that was a particularly good idea. And I started reaching out to people with you know, this admittedly pushy plan that I wanted to go and actually work in the art world, like work at galleries, work for artists. And people assured me that this was impossible, maybe even dangerous. Uh, I had a seasoned art collector tell me that my, my plan was really a terrible idea if I wanted to keep living in New York City. I had people, I got threats, warnings. Someone told me that they'd trash my professional, personal, psychological reputation if I wrote anything they disagreed with. And really, you know, found the art world to be incredibly secretive, incredibly closed off. Like, as I mentioned, I spent a lot of time in China doing research. And China is not an easy place to be a foreign journalist. Like talking to a foreign journalist can get you arrested. And yet nothing prepared me for how difficult it would be to get inside the art world. I did do it eventually. And what followed was really this, this five-year journey where I worked at galleries selling art. I worked with artists in their studios. I worked as a security guard in an art museum, embedded with collectors, curators all as part of this journey to understand, like, why does art matter and how do any of us engage with it more deeply? When you say receive threats, these were folks that you were trying to spend time with and like work on their side of the profession. And they didn't want you around because you had divulged that you were a journalist wanting to write some kind of an experiential critique on the industry. Or I'm sure you didn't position it as I'm going to write a hit piece. All right. 
No, no. And I don't think I don't think the book it is a piece by any means. I think it's a love story ultimately. Mm-hmm. And I think it's like a lot of love stories. There's agony and there's ecstasy. But but yes, I think ultimately it is, I think, a celebration of art's place and necessity in our lives. But but yeah, these were people who, who knew I was a journalist. But and I think that part of it was that I was a journalist. I think that the art world views secrecy as key to its survival. And part of it is that there are things that go go on that would pass for absurd, unethical, illegal in other places. And so if you haven't sworn this mafia like omerta vow of silence, you're viewed as a risk. But it wasn't only because I was a journalist. And so as I started, my first job was working as an assistant at this very cool up and coming gallery in Brooklyn. And I began to be initiated in, into what I would describe as the strategic snobbery that the art world uses to keep people out. I worked for a dealer who was, whose basic term for general public was Joe Schmo, right? So that should give you some idea of the regard in which the general public is held or lack thereof. And, and I think that you encounter it in a myriad different ways. I quickly discovered that there was a right way to behave in the art world if you wanted if you had a dream or a hope of being taken seriously by this influential group of tastemakers. I was told I needed a makeover. I dressed like I worked for a quote unquote catering company. I was told to tone down my superficial enthusiasm and nix certain words from my vocabulary. Like a work is not sold, it's placed. Um, it's not uh, you know, a website, it's an online viewing room. Art speak, I mean, it makes tasting notes look downright Sensical. I really think that's even. It's even more. It does even. Can it's even greater greater crimes against the English language than than tasting notes do, which is saying something. Art speak is this idea that like basically the bigger the word, the better. The more incomprehensible, the the hipper. And I think art speak doesn't. It was developed not as a form of clear communication, but essentially, as people have written, as an exclusionary code that distinguishes you as someone who does or does not get it. Then let's talk about even how galleries are placed. Like a lot of galleries are basically hidden from the general public. They're on second floors. They're in buildings that look like they house apartments. There's probably, sometimes, but probably not, like a little teeny sign that doesn't usually include helpful words like art or gallery. And you might be thinking, okay, like a ground level storefront is expensive. Yes, but also I had a dealer tell me that they actively didn't want to be on the ground level because then you have to deal with, and I quote, random ass people walking in. Even if you find the art, good luck finding out much more than that. Galleries don't list their prices most of the time and then will often refuse to sell you things even if they're for sale. So I guess what I'm trying to get at is that this, there are these deliberately erected barriers to entry uh, that don't just apply to journalists, but that apply to, you know, the schmolitariat, to all of us. And I think that they exist For deliberate reasons, right? To build mystique, to concentrate power in the hands of gatekeepers, to maintain the image of the art world as being for a self-anointed few that conform to certain norms. So on on that side of things, I mean, there's obviously a a, a in in (laughs) selling wine and selling art because uh, at most years, everybody wants to sell as much wine as possible. I think the only time I've heard people saying no to a table for wine is when they're too drunk and they won't appreciate it enough. <laughs> right. um, so I think that's interesting. What, what did you find in terms of parallels with the collectors? Because I, I know you spent some good time, um, at least in the most recent book with collectors. I, I know in the other one too, you spent some time. Aside from parallels of like passion, did you see other, any other similarities or any like glaring differences? I'd say the groups were actually more different than I'd expected. I think if you think about the the group of people that can afford to collect wine en masse, who can afford to collect art in in at some scale, and you assume, okay, it's the same, same sort of group, right? There's only so many of them are the same. They didn't overlap as much as I anticipated they were. I think that there is a real hedonistic character that is drawn to wine. And I think that art collecting, in my experience, how would I put it? It was perhaps more less about like immediate pleasure and more about this either long term social play or long term sort of reputational strategery or 
wealth planning thing. I think what does unite both of them is that there is, in the best cases, just a deep love and pleasure for being in proximity to either wine or And I think that there is something really wonderful about the way that some collectors, first of all, feel that buying art and living with it allows these works to act on their consciousness day in, day out. They are living with something that is not a neutral presence. It has a sort of force field of energy and it changes you. And I know it's funny, I ended up working as a guard at the Guggenheim. And if I sound like a little crazy in this, part of it is that over the course of spending so many hours with artworks, I began to develop really what I feel were relationships with these inanimate objects. Like I, I, there was a sculpture by Constantin Brancusi, Brancusi, or Brancusi of, a, of a sort of swoop of white marble. And I had this feeling around it that I could only recognize from being in love, that feeling that I could be around it for as long as I could see into the future without ever tiring of its company. And yeah, I think that there is that element that, that some art buyers get from art. I think there's also this sense of supporting the ecosystem. Um, and I think wine buyers will have that too. I, I, after having spent time in the wine world, I'm always telling people, like, don't feel bad about spending money in restaurants. I think a lot of people complain about the markups on wine. But they're like, why am I paying three times more for this when I could buy it at Mr. Liquor down the block for a fraction of the price? And I'm always like, because you believe in restaurants because you want to see them succeed. Wine is how these institutions make money. So you're not just buying the 750 milliliters of fermented grape juice. You are helping to pay the insurance, the rent, the electricity, the starch napkins on your lap, the wages of the people there. So I do, I do think that it's easy to dismiss the activities of, of, of these collectors as being like flinging money around. But at the same time, I, I do think that there is something also to celebrate about, let's say, art collectors who spend money to support emerging artists, people who are up and coming and struggling. And that that money is the difference between being able to continue paying rent on their studio or not. Or the, the wine buyers who are helping small businesses continue. I'm not naive. I know that it, it goes up exponentially from that. Someone told me that you, the, their definition of art collector was has the word warehouse entered your vocabulary? So I'm certainly not naive. I know it gets to the level where people are just like, they have these door houses, temperature controlled, just treasure vaults of more wine than you could ever drink in a lifetime, more art than you could ever live with. That's a different level. That's for a separate conversation. <laughs> yeah, no, I first, I, I will note Brancusi's Bird in Space has always been a thing that I've always loved as well and could stare at that for for hours. So I'm with you on the Brancusi side of things. I was also wanted to talk about, in addition to collectors, the influence of critics. Because I think that we, for example, the 2018 Argiano, Brunello de Montalcino was Wine Spectator's Wine of the Year. We're still getting calls every day. You have more. Do you have more? But what I thought was interesting is not only how are consumers impacted and like how do they change their behavior based on these criticisms, but also how you were talking about auction prices in the wine or in the in the art world and how certain movements could maybe negatively impact the long-term view of that piece. Whereas I don't think that, or that artist, and I don't think that happens as much in the, in the wine world. There are fads and trends, obviously, but I, I don't think there's a, the same correlation. Yeah, I think in both worlds, prices bear some modicum of relationship to reality, but also very little in some ways. I think it's also important just to note that like wine is something that is in, how would I put this? Like gets destroyed, right? Like you start with 12 bottles, you drink them, some of them go bad. These things, there's, a, there's also an expiration date for the wine, which is different from art. But I do think that in both cases, pricing is a spice, right? It is something that influences people's enjoyment of the thing itself, be it wine or art, and would be naive to think otherwise. Critics, it's interesting. The idea of assigning a point score to a painting is, I think, even more anathema to the art world than it is to the wine world. I think there's many people in the wine world who are like, how could, even in this day and age, really disagree with the practice of assigning a number to wine? Like, how could you, how do you, how do you do that? Blah, 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 blah. But it's funny that I think they said you could get a full stage revolt. Just New York would be burned down if people started trying to assign 
to have point scores. They could argue maybe price is, is some attempt to do that. I don't know. I do think it's interesting, though, just to note, someone observed to me once that, or a few people, that art criticism in this day and age has become less, has become a bit more toothless. In the sense that if you look at their, their argument was that if you looked at art criticism from a few decades ago, it was like restaurant criticism today, where there were, there were, you'd pan things sometimes. Like there'd be, you would trash a show. You would really have negative things to say in a, in a way that restaurant critics do. And some wine critics do as well. Although I think in a lot of magazines, we tend to only hear the good news. And so I do think with both, I think there's an interesting conversation, with both fields, it's an interesting conversation to have around are we are we too critical enough? I don't think any of us want to be the victim of a bad review. I hope I'm not putting like a target on my back and saying this, but I just thought it was an interesting observation that I think some people in the art world kind of miss. I feel like the, the criticism has has a bit less weight if it's only ever positive. I'm not saying it always is. Just look at the Whitney Biennial and you'll find that people were more than happy to to pull take the claws out or whatever the expression is but yeah i i don't yeah i don't know maybe that's a bigger philosophical conversation that we can have yeah the art world i'm actually really taken aback by the differences that you mentioned i never really thought about even just point scoring which seems to be an obvious yeah an obvious difference between the two worlds but the idea that i guess the art world is from the outside, it seems so much more distributed than the wine world because we have this scale in wine of, you know, you're in if you're 93 points and above and, you know, probably out if not, and that that doesn't really exist or maybe exists in different ways in the art world is is interesting to me. And you mentioned, like, the difference between there's a collector who maybe will buy only, you know, five, ten million dollar grand works of art, and there's the collector who likes to support up and coming artists, emerging artists who need that next ten, fifteen thousand dollar check to pay the rent at their studio. It makes me think of also the juxtaposition between folks who only drink Grand Cru Burgundy versus those who go to the recesses of different regions to find the farm and the farmer who's been making wine for three generations. Um yeah, I I guess not a question there, but more just a general observation that um there are more stark differences, like you said, uh, than I maybe initially anticipated. Here's another one that I think really jumped out at me. So I talked about these deliberately erected barriers to entry and that the art world puts up. And I think that they apply not only to finding the art and buying it, but also to appreciating it. And I started Early on in my conversations with art connoisseurs, being really taken aback by how little time they spent discussing the merits of the artworks themselves. Mm -hmm. And instead, they talked about, like, where did the artist go to school? Who's shown the work? Who owns it? Who is this artist sleeping with at the moment? Who are their friends? Those questions all get at the artist's context, right? It's the context, of the web of names around the artist. It's in some cases like their social cachet. And that, even more than the works itself, seemed to influence people's perception of the art. That was, I think, jarring to me, especially coming from the world of wine, where I felt like, look, I, of course that happens, right? I, I write a lot about in Cork Dork the way that flavor is not just taste and smell, but it is also price, color. Our, our perception of the quality of a wine can be influenced by who we're sitting down to dinner with, whether we're paying for that bottle, the color of the tablecloth, the lighting, the, the, the volume in the room, all of these other things. That being said, blind tasting to me was entirely an exercise about trying to tune out all the things that are designed to play to our sensory biases so that you can stay true to your own felt experience of the wine. And here I was in the art world being told that that old, that experience, that internal experience that I was having of the artwork was somehow irrelevant or less important than the context of the work. Someone told me that if you don't know the context, you can't understand what the fuck you're looking at. And so again, that was just surprising to me. It really took me back. This idea that for a lot of these art connoisseurs, there was a sense that it wasn't about just the object in front of you, that that was not enough to understand the work or have a meaningful experience. 
I will say that for me, look, as I said, the kind of guiding questions for this book, it was for me a journey to develop my eye. And I was interested in why does art matter? How do we engage with it more deeply? And I think I pre- tried to at least to present many different answers to those questions. But there were some that resonated more with me than others. And I think for me, in my own relationship with art and my own development of my eye, something really clicked when I started working for up and coming artists in their studios. And it was there that I think I began to understand how to look at art more like an artist. It meant slowing down. It meant paying attention to the physical form of the work. It meant examining the decisions that an artist had made for that piece. And that was something that I really took back to me when I started going back to galleries and museums. And for the first time in my life, I ignored the wall labels. The wall labels are like those little paragraphs of text that are pasted next to a lot of works, particularly in museums, which I'd never done before. I used to feel like it was rude when those didn't, didn't have wall labels next to every work. I was like, how am I supposed to understand what this is about if you don't tell me in written English? Instead, I tried to stay in the work. I took an artist's advice to just notice five things about the piece. And they don't have to be grandiose. It's not like, oh, this print probes femininity in the social media age. It could just be like, this green makes me want to touch it. Uh, this hand looks suspiciously like an octopus. And I felt like in doing that and, in, in, again, staying in the work, paying attention to those decisions, I could tune out the context. I could not just stare in art's direction, but I could see it. And I at least became convinced that everything you need to have a meaningful experience with art is right in front of you. Um, and so, yeah, I just mentioned that as like another another difference between these worlds. And, and again, I, I think that there's different types of people in these worlds. And I was really lucky to find this sort of rebel alliance of artists and gallerists who, who did believe that art is for everyone, that it is even cutting edge art is necessary and that you yourself as a viewer have all the tools to have a conversation with it. doesn't mean that we can't spend a little more time or push ourselves a bit. as research that shows that we spend somewhere between like two and 17 seconds with an artwork. So probably many need more than that. Billy, you must have learned this in your art history education. Probably not enough time to fully go deep. Uh, but you have to be willing to linger with that uncertainty. And you will come out stronger the other side, I promise. That's the reason we don't chug wine, too. We swirl it and, dip it and swish it and things like that. Yeah, I was actually just thinking about your your extended periods of time with um, art yesterday when I was actually at the gym. Our, one of the instructors was like, I was forced to be in a two-minute fold at this yoga class the other day. And he's like, really open your mind. When you do something for an extended period of time, it, it changes your perspective on that, in that case, a stretch. But uh, yeah, no. I love, I, I love that two minutes is an extended period of time in our day and age, but. <laughs> well, he, he was doing like, a, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm, I'm not, a, I'm not a yogi. That does sound like, I don't know that I can hold a stretch for two minutes, but I'm, it was I'm some just, sort I'm of part of it. Yeah. No, <laughs> when you saw him doing it, I was like, nah, I can't, I can't do that for 30 <laughs> seconds, much less two minutes. And, but uh, yeah, I think that's, I, I think that all makes, makes complete sense. And I really liked your, your perspective because I, I like when I'm trying to explain wine to people, I wish people knew more about I wish they had more context, actually. It's the opposite. Is yeah. I wish they knew what all the work that w- went on in the vineyard, all the time this person spent sorting the grapes or hand pressing or skin contact. I almost think that would actually help wine more than it would take away, which so I, with all my friends, I try to explain that. But uh, yeah, and I, I think it, it's but interesting I think that's to me. me what almost what like, paying attention to the decisions means is that is, I guess you could say that that is context, but it's like what you're describing, like those are also the decisions that made that went into making this glass of wine, right? Yeah, it is like, a process. I, and yeah. I think it is a process. And it's not that it's the only way into these, understanding these things. Uh, but I think it's one that, at least in art's case, like you can do without having spent years getting a master's degree or going to art fairs or memorizing biographies. But I, I interrupted you. So you're going to say, yes, you trying to get people to understand that more. And then I told the trash too. No, no, I, I think, yeah, no, I, I always, I've drawn parallels. This, I actually got into wine because of my passion for art. And I thought it was the same way as the, the mediums are, are the grapes and the processes and winemakers are the artists. So I, I definitely do, do think that's a process itself. But I'm also thinking that I was, just got back from a trip when we were driving around Croatia and they're like these really steep, vineyards with bush vines and it's like if you were just drinking a bottle of that wine it's probably here like 25 bucks but if you know that somebody has to walk up 30 degree slope to hand harvest these weird bush vines probably in intense heat it gives you a little bit more that's not necessarily going into the wine itself but it's zoom out and it would make me appreciate that bottle more than like a a machine just driving over and getting my 
a bottle of cab for the same price from Napa. That's what I was getting at. I, I will say I, I have a soft spot for wall labels because in my time and working in art, I did write a few and I was very proud of them. Not to like to name drop, but my boss used to be friends with, not always boss, but also professor with David Hockney. So one of the wall labels I wrote for a Hockney print, he sent it to Hockney and then Hockney just wrote back like the student's work is good. But it was like, it was, a, it was, a, thank you. Yeah, it was a collage, a digital collage of a lot of his pieces. So I was actually interpreting what he was trying to say. So the fact that he said that was, it was a classic like thing, but it's rare that you actually have an artist alive to tell you that your interpretation made sense. So that was nice. Yeah. But like to your point, it, it's like always, they would tell you, you don't, don't, it, it's the exact opposite of wine. My boss would be like, don't put what, don't put feelings, don't put things that like people could objectively disagree with. Cause if you start telling people, this is what it makes you feel and they don't feel that they're just going to either walk away or they're not going to try to appreciate the piece. And I'm like, like at, at the same time, like, I feel like people to your point, only read the wall labels and walk away. So it's like, do you want them to get some more info or do you want them? Cause I wish you could just have them like have walls come up and have them have to sit and look at it. And then they would actually look at the piece. Otherwise they will just do what you say, and zoom around and read the wall labels. I love that. I love the Billy Museum where everyone will be like handcuffed to the work of art for a certain amount of time. <laughs> And you have to go in the right order around the gallery. That was always driving me nuts. Reed, is there anything else? I know we're running, we've run a little bit over here, but I, I've really enjoyed the conversation. Yeah, Bianca, thank, thanks a lot. The, I think we'd probably talk all day about the parallels and differences between the two spaces and the approach you took to both of the books. And like you said, experiential learning and experiential journalism. Yeah, I think that, like you said, there's no other way to experience these disciplines, worlds, whatever you want to call them. That than to do that. Yeah, we appreciate that work. Is it? It's so kind of you so much for reading the books and your interest in them and having me on. Very grateful. All right. That was our interview with Bianca Bosker presented by Corvin, the gift that pours possibilities. Give the gift of exploration with Corvin, opening a world of wine experiences without the fear of waste. It's not too late. It's Father's Day coming up here, and it's basically a great gift for any holiday, any special occasion, even 4th of July. So give the gift to Corbin. Use the code VENT15 for 15% off your next purchase. And again, if you're a member of the trade, you can visit trade.corvin.com. Uh, that was our interview and episode for this week. Everybody should go buy Bianca Bosker's books or listen to them. Again, they are cork to work and get the picture. I thoroughly enjoyed them. Highly recommend them. And that is it for us this week. We'll be back with another interview next week. Cheers. Cheers.